The Global Citizenship Program is delighted to welcome Dr. Margaret Busby, who is an editor, publisher, and broadcaster, as well as the recent chair for the 2020 Booker Prize for an interview to celebrate International Women's Day as part of our Ustinov Meet series. The theme for International Women's Day this year is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World, with the tagline, Choose to Challenge. Thank you so much for being here today, Margaret. Thanks for inviting me. As part of our activities for International Women's Day, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your career to date? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Since I'm an old lady, so it will take the whole interview. Now, I, I am at the moment, um, although I'm, I'm always billed as a publisher, I haven't actually been a publisher as such for a long time. I started a publishing company when I was uh, about 20. I was uh, always... Uh, I'm always referred to as the UK's youngest at that time and first black woman publisher, which I, I suppose in retrospect was true, but at the time I didn't realise that was happening. And uh, I co-founded a company called Alison and Busby, Busby, and that was with somebody I met called Clive Allison. And we ran that company, um, well, I was there for, for two decades, for 20 years, and it changed ownership. It's still going, but I have nothing to do with it anymore. It's, the name is still there, but it's a bit like, you know, Marks and Spencer, who's Marks and who's Spencer, you know. Nobody knows who the originators are, but it's, it's still there. And after that, I went to another company and, uh, called Earthscan. So I've, I've been involved with publishing um, for the first bit of my career, but then mostly freelancing after the, the 90s. So I would call myself a publisher, an editor, a writer. I've done broadcasting. I've done all sorts of things. You know, maybe I'll do brain surgery next. <laughs> wow, that's wild. <laughs> so as you were uh, saying, in 1967, you founded the uh, publishing house with your partner, Alison and Busby. Could you tell us what motivated you to begin your own publishing house and your vision for the company when it began? Well, actually, the company I co-founded was conceived when I was still at university. And how that happened was that I, I had um, a friend who was somebody I'd known um, from school days, and she was uh, having her first novel published. And she was also uh, about to get married, so it was a, she was having an engagement come publication party in um, a house in 100 Bayswater Road, which is actually where J.M. Barry wrote Peter Pan. Um, but her cousins lived there, and so she invited friends. I was at Bedford College. I was invited as one of her friends, and uh, her fiancé invited, who was then at Oxford, he invited his friends, including a, a friend of his called Clive Allison. And you know at parties how people introduce you to people doing similar things, and I'd been publishing poetry and editing my college magazines. I was introduced to this guy who was doing things at his College, um, Oxford, at, at Trinity College, Oxford. He had been publishing poetry or whatever. And you know, we chatted and we started saying, you know, what are you going to do when you graduate? Well, I thought I might try publishing. Well, so do I. Let's start a publishing company. So that's how it started. We were still uh, undergraduates. We had no ideas about publishing, except that we, we were both interested in poetry. I was actually writing poetry. And we wanted to make poetry available for young people like us at a price that we could afford. So we started publishing cheap poetry paperbacks, five, four, five shilling paperbacks. And that, that was the rationale behind it, doing something that we thought wasn't already happening. So in 1967, and we, we left, uh, I, I graduated when I was 20, and uh, we, we met up, for, I, we, it was only ever a, a business relationship, because I was actually, in the end, married to a jazz musician. So we decided we were going to publish, we had three, three books we wanted to publish, and we, we didn't know how many copies to print, so we had 15,000 poetry paperbacks, typeset and electric typewriter, no distribution, and that was the start of Alison and Busby. In fact, even the name, we kept thinking up names. We thought, what should we call ourselves? I mean, we thought Gemini, two of us, and, and Clive's birthday was in June. We had to submit names to the Board of Trade or whoever, and they said, well, you can't have that name. Somebody's already got it. So we had all these uh, setbacks with what the name might be. And then we thought, well, they can't object to our own names. 
So that became Alice Nabosby. We, we thought at least, well, that's A and B, not you know Q and W or something. So that's how the name came about. It was all doing things you know, as we went along. We didn't have any experience, obviously, you know, straight out of university. You, you, don't, you haven't had a job before. You don't know what the precedents are. And luckily, you probably haven't got mortgages or, or dependents at that age either. So we just did what we wanted to do. And that was the, the birth of Alison and Busby. We started with three five shilling paperback purchase books published so that young people like us could afford books. That's such a wonderful reason to start a company. I love poetry. So I always love that publishers push for it. <laughs> um, as you were saying, you worked prolifically since your start in the in the industry in the 1960s um, in roles that have included author, publisher, literary judge, panelist, com columnist, and many more. Of the roles that you've had taken during your career, what is your greatest passion and um, sustains your motivation to work as hard as you do? What is my greatest passion? Um, I love editing. It, editing is actually editing is really quite a peculiar role, job, skill, whatever. Because if you do it well, nobody knows you exist. People will say, "What a great book! What a good writer!" They will never say, "What a brilliant editor." But what the editor is trying to do is help the writer say what they want to say in the best possible way. And I always use the analogy of being a midwife. You deliver a beautiful baby. Everybody says, beautiful baby, wonderful, well done, mom. They don't say, what a good midwife. But it couldn't happen without that sort of collaboration, if you like. So that's something that I, I really like, the collaborative thing that comes about through editing, working with writers, encouraging writers, nurturing writers, and seeing writers develop into writers, people delivering creative work that so many people can enjoy. So it, it, it just becomes a collaborative sort of venture that enriches everybody. And, and I suppose that goes along with everything along the way. So it's the writing, it's the editing, it, it's the publishing, it's the reviewing, it's the judging. It's all part of that same process of trying to enrich people's lives by make, making literature good and accessible and inclusive, all those things that, that go towards making a good reading experience. That's amazing. And I think that you um, definitely have managed that nurturing aspect with your anthologies that you have uh, edited. Um, so you compiled the uh, works by women of African descent uh, titled Daughters of Africa, which was originally released in released in 1992. And the anthology um, amplified female voices and brought their work to a much wider international audience. Um, and then in 2019, you released your second anthology titled New Daughters of Africa, um, which was also released to wide acclaim. What inspired you to complete the first anthology? And after 27 years, uh, what motivated you to release the second? And further, did your experiences compiling the anthologies differ? in 1992 versus 2019? Well, I suppose I have to say, first of all, that I was always very aware of how many wonderful women writers were out there and women of African descent. There were, there were women of African descent who inspired me um, in my youth. In, my, in fact, the very first time I remember seeing an African woman on the cover of a British literary magazine was when I was still at school and I, I was reading a literary magazine which doesn't exist anymore. It didn't exist for that long. It was called John of London's Weekly. And on the cover it had the, a South African woman called Noni Jabavu. And I was so impressed. I still have that volume. I think it was from about 1960 or 61. Noni Jabavu, she, she had just written um, a book, was being reviewed. She also was, was an editor of, of, of um, New Strand Literary Magazine in, in, in Britain. So she was a literary figure that I could see was an African woman and gave me something to aspire to. So that was one of the things that kind of motivated me without my knowing it. And so along the way, I 
as a reader, I would read lots of uh, books and other anthologies. And I, in fact, I would seek out anthologies, particularly because you got a range of, of, of writers. And I was at school in Britain, so my curriculum was really the sort of British writers. So, I, you know, of course, I read Milton and Shakespeare and Chaucer and all the things that one would expect to be in, in the traditional English literature course. But I didn't see any writers who, with whom I could identify. And I began to seek out anthologies. For example, there, there were some British, British published companies that had an educational bent that published books for you know, the colonial regions, whether it was in Africa or the Caribbean. So, so we're talking about people like Longmans and Macmillans, and there would sometimes be anthologies published in, in their series. And I would seek out um, a few books I would find from America, which again, were a bit ahead. So, you know, anthologies of poetry by the Negro or whatever. So there, there were anthologies published, but I, I began to, to see that although you might come across an anthology called, you know, stories from the the Caribbean or from the West Indies, it wouldn't say by men, but there wouldn't be many women, if any women in it, or you know, poetry from Africa, not necessarily by men, but where are the women? So that was something I was aware of without knowing I was aware of it, except until I found a letter um, a couple of years ago from Wallace Inca, which he'd written to me um, in the 70s when he was an editor of a, mag of a literary magazine called Transition and he was replying to something I'd obviously said to him when I met him in London and I'd taken him to task because he hadn't put out an anthology that didn't have many women in it. So this letter he wrote back to me was saying, yes you're right, I'll, it shows you how unbiased I am, I'll try harder next time. So that was in about 1975, so that shows you when I was aware of the need to include women in African, um, the African literary canon and so on. And so in the late 80s, I met a very progressive editor called Candida Lacey, who worked with a, a women's publishing co company called Pandora. And they had just published, um, in fact, I think it was a, a volume of, I can't remember the, the editors, a volume of writing by British women with two editors, obviously in English, and Candida decided that she would like me to work on an anthology of African women writers or women of African descent. So here I was taking on the world on my own in every language and every genre, and I put together the first volume, which was Daughters of Africa, which Canada had commissioned, and then Canada, the company she was with, was taken over, I think, by Harlan College, and eventually in Canada ended up an editor at Jonathan Cape. And I kind of followed her. I always say that I was her literary stalker. So I ended up following Candida the Cape, and the book Daughters of Africa came out in 1992 from Jonathan Cape. And that was put together really in, in a very... Well, I curated it in a very particular way. Like I have a lot of lot of books and magazines in my house. I live in the library, if you like, lots of books. So I would just pick books off the shelves and decide what I wanted and put it all together. And then, of course, you have to apply to, for permission to the authors or the editors or the agents. And they, they come back and say, you can use that piece if it'll cost you that much. So I put together the anthology in that way. The publisher had to make, pay permissions fees to, to the owners of the copyright and all these these uh, pieces that I put together. And they were extracts from novels and short stories and poetry and, and all those things from around the world. And some things in translation. In fact, you know, I used some pieces by Afro-German women. And my brother, who happened to be studying Germany, did the translation because I couldn't afford any translators. And so that, that came out in 1992. And it went out of print, maybe, maybe because Canada left and the and editor, agent, editors there didn't keep it going. And once a book goes out of print, you have to pay the permissions fees again if you want to reprint it. 
And that would have been quite expensive because I think originally the permission fees must have come to like £10,000. And so to reprint it, we'd have had to pay that, maybe more and whatever. So, but we wanted to have something that actually was continuing that legacy. And we wanted to, particularly because there were so many people that I met who were influenced by Daughters of Africa. And by then, Canada was publisher of Myriad Editions. And so I, I, I had remained friends with Canada since the late... 80s. In fact, I always say that she, she did me a, a, a great, uh, paid me a great compliment by having her daughter on my birthday. <laughs> and so her daughter Eve has the same birthday as I do. So Camden and I decided in, you know, in the 20s, you know, 20 teens, what do you call it? 20 teens. Anyway, we decided, <laughs> the, the only, we decided if we can't reprint that, we're going to do another venture. And we're going to do it in a way that has some sort of continuing benefit for women of African descent and the literary world. And so what we did, I mean, I, I drew up a, a spreadsheet of hundreds of names of potential people I'd like to include in a new volume. And it's going to be completely new. Nobody in the first volume is in the second volume. And so... I had to find everybody's emails and I'd write to people saying, we want to do this uh, anthology. And unfortunately we, we can't afford a lot of money, but what we want to do is ask you, people to waive their fees. And because of that, we'll have some sort of charitable outcome from this anthology. So that's what happened. I wrote to everybody and said, you know, would you like to contribute? And you know, most of them, if I got the email right, wrote back, said, yes, we'd love to. And, you know, and I said, well, you know, send me something, make sure it's this sort of length because we want to have a lot of people in it. So no more than whatever it was we said, I can't remember, two or three pages of poetry or so many thousand, couple of thousand words for prose. And we got some wonderful contributions. Nobody asked to be paid. Everybody waived their fees. And between uh, 2018 and 2019, we put together and published New Doors of Africa. It was actually published on International Women's Day in 2019. Very appropriate. There you go. And because of the, the generosity of all these women, we set up something which is called the Margaret Busby New Daughters of Africa Award, which is collaboration between Myriad Editions, SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, me and all these generous women who waive their fees so that a woman student from Africa can go to SOAS and have a free course of study in collaboration with International Student House and free accommodation because of this anthology. And the, the first recipient of this award is actually there at the moment, and she was called Idza, and she benefited from all the, the generosity of the women in New York of Africa and everybody buying the anthology. So it had this wonderful knock-on effect. So we hope the anthology um, will keep reverberating. We hope the award will keep being regenerated. It's open for people to contribute if they want to. There's a crowdfunding page. And so there'll be this legacy from both anthologies, if you like, because people in the second anthology, many of them said, well, I became a writer, I was inspired by the first anthology. So there's this wonderful ripple effect that's continuing from those amazing women in the first volume, the amazing William, the women in the second volume, the women who read it and are inspired, and, and so on. So I, I just hope, and, it, and we're not just talking about women of African descent, it's anybody can enjoy the book, whether they're, they're male, female, African or not. It's full of some wonderful writing. So I've been waffling on. I hope I made sense. Absolutely. And what a beautiful outcome to what sounds like an immense amount of hard work. Um, well, it was fun. <laughs> In fact, pe people used to ask me uh, with the first volume, how long did it take to put together? And I would say that it either took me, you know, two or three years or all my life, depending on how you look at it. And with the second volume, I re realized that actually it was a harder 
thing to put it together because I was asking people for work that was not going to attract fees. And so it was mostly new work, which of course required editing. So somebody would send me something and I'd say, well, you know, can, can we shape it a bit? It's a bit long. So it was a bit of to and fro with emailing, much more work. And yet somehow it happened to take, it took much less time. So it, was, it took about 18 months, uh, the maximum, to put it together. But also I think in that same time frame, I went to do an editing workshop in Uganda. I went to do things in Australia. And I wrote, you know, 6,000 emails to, to compile the sound bites. I really don't know how I did it in retrospect, but it happened. It was just meant to happen, I think. It sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> and definitely, um, you can tell that representation is so important for people to be able to see that there are African women writers. And even, as you were saying, to see um, an African publisher on a magazine. So with that in mind, uh, within the publishing industry, there have been several initiatives over the last 40 years which have aimed to increase diversity and inclusion across the sector. What do you see as the greatest opportunities and challenges to promote strength through diversity in publishing? And could you identify one change that would really make a difference? I think it's really important that there is diversity within every publishing company. So we're not just talking about publishing companies saying, let's publish diverse writers. And what, when I, I, I don't even like those words, diverse and inclusive, because you're publishing good writing. You're not doing some favor to writers who are somehow substandard and we're giving them sort of a quota. In fact, one of the things that, that I heard when I was promoting New Doors of Africa in 2019, and I was going to different festivals, and somebody in the one of my audiences said that they'd had a talk from a mainstream publisher who had actually been using the terminology normal books and diverse books. As if, you know, the normal books were books that didn't include, you know, a diverse reading. And that, I think, is probably the mindset of the industry, not even inadvertently, they, they're not even aware because they, they have been doing things in a certain way and they continue to do those things and even now I think it's not a question of doing a favor to diverse writers it's having people within the firm who can choose things from every perspective now it's not as if I only read books by black or African writers you know so it's, it's just having different perspectives to make the whole enterprise richer so I, I think publishing companies as well as having initiatives to include more diverse writers or BAME writers or whoever, have to think, what can we do within the company to make sure that we are getting the richest experience out of the, the whole thing? And it's not for me to tell them necessarily how to do it. In fact, one of the things I remember reading, it was um, an interview by Marianne Jean-Baptiste, Jean an actress, and she had said, she was tired of being asked the same question about how, how to, what to do about the diversity issue. And she'd say, well, if I'm not invited you to your party, don't ask me how, why. <laughs> you, you know. So it's a question of, <laughs> it's a question of what the industry needs to, to, to do, and not, not as a favor. And it, Again, I, I remember talking with Tony Morrison, who was another figure who I found inspiration because Tony Morrison, as well as being a wonderful writer, or at the same time as being a wonderful writer, was also a publisher's editor. She worked at Random House, and she, when I was publishing in the in the 1970s, she was one of the few uh, black editors I knew, and so you know I would meet her when when she came to London. In fact, let me tell you another story because beloved by Tony Morrison. Uh, was published in um, first of all in the states. Then it was published over here, I think, in 1987. And Tony had come over here to, prom to promote it for the British publisher. And there was some television program who was going to have a conversation with between me and Tony. I think probably about publishing or editing. And then last minute, the item was dropped. 
And I realized when I spoke to a young researcher of ours, it was because they thought that Tony wasn't well enough known. Because at that point, she had not won any major prizes. And so what happened, uh, I had a friend who was uh, just finished film school. Tony had an hour free in her schedule, so I didn't have time to reread her book. So we made our own interview with Tony Morrison. And she went on to win the Pulitzer Prize. We sold that interview to Channel 4. But that's how recent it was in 1988. And then even when she won the Nobel Prize in 1992, she was not known universally. I mean, within the black community, she was known because that was her, her prime audience, if you like. But I remember speaking to somebody on the, uh, well, I won't mention names, on the national newspaper who said, Tony Morrison, who's he? And again, in 1992, Woli Shienka won the Nobel Prize, and he wasn't necessarily as mainstream as he's seen to be now. And so my phone was going, quickly, can you write about, you know, it was Derek Walcott, sorry, Derek Walcott and Tony Morrison were the two figures who won the Nobel Prize who are not really well known until they won that prize. And so although many people within the, the black community knew Walcott or Morrison, the mainstream literary community didn't yet know them as well as they should have done. So my phone kept going, oh, can you quickly write something about Tony Morrison for our four o'clock deadline, or can you come on and talk about it? So that, that's something that I was very conscious of, that you can get to that, you can, you can be a brilliant writer, you can be well known within the community who take you as one of theirs, but you still have a long way to go to become a universally known figure. And Tony, where she is now is where she always deserved to be. She's a huge influence on a lot of people. Her writing continued to be brilliant. And she has done a lot for the publishing industry in terms of what she did, who she published as, a, as an editor. She published Angela Davis. She published, I, I, I can't name them all. She published something called The Black Book, which she, she was an editor for that. So she has had an influence on both sides. And one of the things I always try and make clear to people, you don't necessarily have to make a choice. You don't have to say, well, if I'm a publisher, I can't be a writer. If I'm an editor, I can't be a writer. You can do both. There are other people who did both. There's a Ghanaian writer called Efwa Sutherland, who was a publisher and a writer. There's another Nigerian writer called Flora Nwapa, publisher and a writer. So it is possible to be a part of the wider literary industry and make contributions in every level. And I suppose in a way, those are the sorts of role models that I have. People who don't say, well, I'm a writer, therefore I, I can't do anything else. You think, well, how can I help other people? How can I make sure that it's a continuation, a continuing process that there's a legacy you hand on to the next generation. You, you pass on any information you know. It's not something you do in, a, in an ivory tower and keep to yourself. You can spread the information, you encourage people, you mentor people if you can, and you try and be there so people can see that you exist and that they can think, well, if she can do it, then maybe I can as well. And so that's one of the things that I'm conscious of. If people don't see in the industry people like themselves, then they'll think, well, it's obviously not for me. I'll do this bit and then they will do something for me. So you, you have, you know, positions where writers think publishers she must do something for me rather than thinking I could be a publisher. So it's not them and us. And we can be, we can all be on either side. So it's not normal and diverse. It's just normal. Absolutely. And it's so important to have different perspectives and different views from both sides with different um, backgrounds and, and how people, where people come from. Um, so you were mentioning um, lots of prizes earlier and you yourself have actually um, been on many literary prize panels, including the Wole Soinka Prize. 
the Commonwealth Book Prize and the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, as well as in 2020, you held the uh, role of chair of the Booker Prize um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. How did the onset of the pandemic affect the more typical approach to deliberations that you might have previously taken as judges? Um, and what were the benefits and challenges uh, that, of the enforced change in your collective approach? I love prizes. I, I love prizes. And I, 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 more than, than the winner, I think it's important to remember there's a short list and a long list. I love long lists. I love short lists, which is all about telling people about the wonderful reading experiences they could have with these books. And although, for example, with the, the Booker Prize, as you said, I, I judged last year, and we, we had about 162 submissions to consider. It's a huge and, amount of books to read. And we had to come down to one winner. So having come down to one winner, I, I'm certainly not saying everything else was rubbish. There were so many wonderful books in the short list, in the long list, books that none of us would have uh, maybe agreed on, but individually we all had our favorites. So there were just so many books that deserved to be showcased and given attention. So I think that's one of the things that prizes can do. Last year, doing the Booker Prize under lockdown was quite a challenge in a way. And we started out, I think we had one meeting where we did it in person. We, you know, we had a, a, a judges, not, not all the judges, because all the judges don't live in London or, or in Britain even. So we never were all in the same room. We've never all met because it had to be done like this by Zoom. We Before had to be popular. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was interesting because you could see glimpses of people's homes. <laughs> so, you know, one judge was in you know, Wisconsin or wherever or Wyoming or New York or Hackney or wherever. So, you, you know, you, that's what happens with Zoom. You don't know where people are. I, I can see wonderful trees in your background. I don't know where you are. but <laughs> The photo of uh, Neville Park, which is the uh, building of Ustinov College. Sadly, not where I live. There you but... go. <laughs> so Beautiful you nonetheless. <laughs> You can't tell from Zoom meetings too much, but it was, it was an interesting experience, and and there was a wonderful panel of judges. I kept my my co judges were, were were just so brilliant. So we were all very different, different in temperament, different in experience, different in whatever we, in background, different in age. I was the oldest, um, but so you know we covered the whole spectrum from writers, people who were editors, people who were publishers, people who were readers, people who were reviewers. And I think that was what was interesting. So we were coming at the reading experience from different perspectives, but we somehow, we all came together to decide the ones that we wanted to go forward. And it was not a scientific process, and it never is judging a prize you're not weighing a book and saying it's got to be exactly this weight. It's which books come up against each other, what's in the climate, what, what issues people are engaging with, what you had for breakfast, what you feel like today, maybe different what you feel like tomorrow. So there are all these non-scientific elements that feed into the judges views of uh, what they're reading and the decision that will ultimately come out of it. And, and we're not dismissing everything that doesn't become a winner. You're just saying, well, this is the one that on this day, this group of people with these books up against each other have decided to say is the winner. It might be different tomorrow. It might have been different next yesterday. And you, know, you don't have to agree with us, but you know, if, you, if you trust our opinion, give it a go. So it's, it's, it's something that is an enjoyable process. It can be enjoyable. I, I, I imagine that it's not always enjoyable because you, you hear stories about past um, judging you know, panels that have come to blows almost or turn the toys out of the pram because their, their opinions aren't uh, considered. So it's, it's really a challenging experience and it was a challenge to do it 
the, the judging and the lockdown. It was challenging for each of us in different ways because of personal situation. In my case, in the middle of it all, my sister died from cancer. So I was managing personal things as well as trying to deal with the, the professionalism of, of judging a price. So we were all, if you like, bringing together our personal situations. And one of the other judges had a baby and you could see that baby growing up <laughs> over the judging you know baby over his shoulder by the end it was, it was it was bigger than it was at the beginning so we were all coping with different personal situations under lockdown as well as the, the new reading um the new way we had to read on um, PDFs on screen and not meeting person, not have a wonderful party when we finished at the end, not have a great ceremony in the guild hall or whatever normally happens. So there were things that were different last year, will be different next year perhaps, and will never be the same. But it was it was it was a one of you know, once in a lifetime achievement uh, uh, opportunity and, and one that I'm grateful to have been given. And I hope that the choices we made will in a way, make people see the prize in a different way because people were talking a lot about how diverse it was. But what was noticeable was also how diverse the judges were. And I think that's what made the difference. And that makes a, makes a huge difference. And I can only imagine all the people on lockdown being so excited waiting for the the books to be announced so I could have something new to read in lockdown. I'm sure you made lots of people happy. <laughs> well, it was, it was it was fun. It was fun and hard work, but worth it. Yeah. Um, so also with the pandemic, um, during the last year, we keep hearing about the role of science and technology in addressing the challenges the world is facing today um, in terms of health crises and climate change. But in your opinion, what's the role of arts in responding to such global challenges? I think every individual has a responsibility to respond to global challenges. So whether whether you're an artist or an activist, I think it's we're all part of a world community. And I think that's what we have to do. You know, obviously, writers take on board different subject matter depending on what is going on out there in the world at large and I, I think in every way in every sphere we, we, we none of us can isolate ourselves from what's happening in the rest of the world we're doing it like this because of what's happening in the rest of the world so the responsibility is not to if you like be selfish but to support each other to think about the next generation if you like as well it's not only what will make us comfortable today in our own little bubble, but it's what we're going to hand on to the next generation. What are they going to inherit from us? What damage are we going to do to the world? Or what reparation are we going to make so that those who come next will be able to have a, a more enjoyable life? And one of, one of the, I, I live by a couple of sayings which people are tired of me repeating because I, I always say them. And one of them come, is a sort of an adaptation of a Greek saying, which I, I heard first from a, a Ghanaian photographer, he's now in his 90s, um, who used to put it on the bottom of his emails. And it can be summed up by saying, plant trees under which you will never sit. And I think that, to me, is something we should all be doing. So we're not planting a tree so that we just get a, a benefit for ourselves, we're doing something we may not benefit from, but we're conscious that we're going to be passing on something to the next generation who may enjoy the benefits of what we have done. And the other saying is, it's astonishing what you can do when you don't care who takes the credit. So it's not that you're doing something so somebody will say, gosh, how clever Rasheen is, what she done, or give her a bite. It's, it's, you're doing it. it, you may get credit, you may get you know, gongs and honorifics and whatever, but that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you think it needs to be done, you believe in what you're doing, and you want to make a difference. You want, in a way, it's, it's about leaving the world in a better place, in a, in a better way than you found it. So I don't want to exit this world and them to think, gosh, what a shame she was in it. Look what a mess she made of it. 
No, I'd rather than say, well, she made some contribution. So each of us can contribute in whatever small way, whatever insignificant way, whatever unrecognized way we can and pass that on. That's the legacy that we can hope to give to not only our own relatives, our own children, people who are connected with us directly, but everybody, the world as a whole. Absolutely. And, and every small bit does eventually grow into a bigger whole, exactly. which is what makes the difference for sure. Um, so along with what I think was very inspiring advice, what is uh, what advice would you give for women and people of color uh, moving into the publishing industry? Well, I think anybody who wants to go into publishing has to see it as a vocation. It's not something you're going into because you think it's going to make you rich necessarily, because it's not necessarily a well-paid um, profession, but you know that you can make a difference. You know you can do something that will contribute to making the world literature, the world of literature richer. And I think one of the things that one has to remember that it's not only about being in one department of the publishing industry, because the publishing, a publishing company has many departments. So you just don't have to think, I like reading, therefore I must be in the editorial department. There's the rights department. There's a sales department, there's a publicity department. So there are all these different skills that people may have that could be focused on one. If you're good at, as a publicist, then you could try and find your feet in, a pub, in the publicity department. If you're, you have a legal background, it's the rights department. So there are, there are different ways that you can contribute to the whole industry. And you have to remember that publishing is it's an art, it's a craft, and it's a business. It's an art in terms of you know, the creativity of literature. It's a craft in terms of the way a book is physically published or presented. And it's a business in terms of you have to survive for it, for it to be a, a publishing company in the first place. You, you can't published in the way that is so unsuccessful that you, you don't survive. So you have to juggle all those parts and try and see how you can make that happen. And sometimes, as happened with Alice and Busby, you, you, you just find your way as you go along. You, you don't necessarily know what the, the right thing to do. You don't necessarily know what the conventions are. And sometimes you break the conventions and that is where you find the success. So you don't have to always do the same things in order to make a difference or to be successful. It's a bit like normal and diverse. You don't always have to be normal if that means doing something that's naturally not right. No, absolutely. That's wonderful advice. And <laughs> if you had um, an opportunity to talk to yourself when you were starting out at 20, would you have any advice for yourself in your own situation? Um, would I have any advice? Wow. Well, I, I think the advice that anybody who's young should remember is that your biggest asset is your own energy. So I didn't have any money when I started out. So you know, it wasn't that some, what advice would I give somebody starting out at that age who happened to be me? I don't know. <laughs> It's always harder to talk to yourself. <laughs> so try another business. <laughs> I say it's not going to be easy, but don't give up. And if you enjoy what you're doing, just keep doing it. Don't expect to be rewarded for it in an easy way. I and mean, you'll find rewards, but not necessarily financial. I think I probably wouldn't give myself any advice because if I did, I'd probably not do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, know, I know too much now. When, your own path. <laughs> when, when, when you're young, you don't know what can go wrong. <laughs> so true. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was an honor to speak with you and hear about all your stories.